Hey, it's Tuesday. It's time I do my regular weekly e-blast that we put out in video format to usually about three to five minutes. It's probably going to be about eight to nine minutes, a little maybe more, uh, because I'm going to share some very important things with you. We're talking about voting today and voting as a Christian. One thing that kind of ticks me off, I would say in a little mild form, is when I read stuff on social media that says it, something like this. You are not a Christian if you vote for, fill in the blank, uh, if you vote for whatever the state office might be, the local office, the presidential campaign, if you vote for Biden, or if you vote for Trump, like you're going to go to hell if you vote for one or the other. Uh, I have some news for you. When you stand before God one day, he's not going to ask you for your voter ID registration card to see what political platform you voted for. I think we'll be held accountable for our actions, but it's not my salvation that's dependent upon that. My salvation uh, is dependent upon a, a personal faith in Jesus Christ. Have I put my trust in him, ask him to forgive my sins, come in my life, and am I choosing to follow Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior? If I have done that, then I am a new creation, and it does affect how I live my life, and I think it affects how I vote. We are the salt. We're the light of the world, the Bible says. So we should uh, seek to do as much as possible in every form and every fashion to affect the culture around us as being the salt and the light. It brings life. It's a preservation, salt is. It brings a, it seasons. It brings, it makes a difference. In other words, light chases out the darkness. It dispels it. So I want to, I want to vote uh, the word of God and vote as close as I can get to those platforms. I want to find out what the Bible has to say. And now there's another group out there that say, well, I just can't vote between the lesser of two evil pastors. I just, I just can't bring myself to do it. I can't, I'm just, I believe that both of these parties or both of these men are just ungodly and the past is ungodly and their personalities I don't like and they're proud and they're arrogant. I just, you know, hey, every election I vote on the lesser of two evils. I've never seen a political candidate that I agree uh, with my biblical convictions agree with 100%. It's just never happened. But so I want to vote as clearly and as closely to that to make a difference and say who is closest to what the Bible has to say, who is closest to their convictions. I can make some changes in the culture, and if I can do it, praise God, I live in a democratic republic. I don't live in Cuba or Russia. I, what I vote, I vote, my vote counts, and it makes a difference. So I'm going to vote biblical convictions, all right? What, what does that mean? Well, my political, my biblical position becomes my political position, and I vote based upon what does the Bible say. I think one of the most obvious things people throw out there is abortion, you know, and some, some Christian groups are trying to minimize abortion today because, you know, well, there's so many other evil things going on. Hey, how can you minimize 60 million babies being slaughtered just in America alone ever since the, the, the legislation Roe v. Wade passed and became, you know, uh, illegal in America to kill babies? I, I'm pro-people. I'm not a racist. I'm, no, God's not a racist. God loves all people, red, yellow, black, and white. They are all precious in his sight. So I'm going to vote, you know, pro-people. I'm going to vote for equality uh, among all people in America. That's where we're going to move to. My, so who's going to do I am pro-justice, all right? But I'm pro-justice of God. God. I'm not according to society's uh, standard or the world's cultural standard. You know, we're in the world, we're not of it. So we have to be cautious not to let the world come in our life and, and let it dictate, you know, uh, our, our affairs. It's like Jesus said, I must be about my father's business. So we have to be cautious when we talk about justice in the culture that we're living in today. In fact, I believe there needs to be a clear understanding of what justice is. And clear understanding of what social justice is. There's a lot of Christians boarding the social justice train they, without even looking to see where, what direction it's going on. The Bible says there's a way that seems right in the end and demand, but the end of it is destruction. So contrary to popular belief and some even some Christian belief, there is a difference between justice as God gives us justice and as the world gives us justice, and there's a difference between social justice. There are a lot of people confused, all right? There's a lot of people who just don't see the difference between the concepts and particularly Particularly, there's a lot of Christians, all right? They, they'll argue that Jesus would be on this social justice movement of the culture today when I think you might have a different argument from Jesus. Jesus uh, was uh, lived in a time when people wanted him to board the social justice train. Scriptures show us in the Gospels how that there were different groups that tried to affect the way his ministry would go. The Jews were an oppressed people. They were they were uh, being misused, mistreated, and abused by the Romans who were in dominion and had authority over the province that they were living in. And they wanted Jesus to come in and rectify the social inequities and the social justice of the Jewish people by kicking out the Romans, overthrowing them, and doing some miraculous things and being the king of the Jews. Hey, there is a day when that's going to happen. That's not too far in the future when Jesus comes. And we'll see the millennial reign of Christ Jesus for a thousand years, that'll happen. But let's just let me take a moment just to, to deal 
parse this and take it apart a little bit for you. Uh, let's look at the dictionary definition. Merriam-Webster defines justice as the impartial administration and maintenance of what is just, what's righteous, what's moral, what's decent, all right? Uh, Proverbs tells us to be that kind of person. The Bible tells us in Isaiah 1, uh, 17 to be a, uh, to pursue justice. Exodus 23, verses 1 through 9. Leviticus talks in chapter 19, verse 15. James chapter, I think it's 1, uh, verse 27. Elsewhere in scriptures, Hosea, that we're to love justice, pursue it, all right? And that's the justice it's talking about, all right? That which is the impartial administration, all right? doesn't favor someone over someone else. Merriam-Webster defines social justice as a state of egalitarianism or a doctrine of egalitarianism, which is the notion that all social and economic and political inequalities must be removed from society. In fact, dictionary.com defines social justice uh, as justice in terms of distribution of wealth, distribution of privileges of society. But that idea of justice that I just read from Merriam-Webster about social justice and from dictionary.com, that's not the justice of God, all right? Justice pursues what is right according to an absolute impartial standard. The Bible lays out those standards. Social justice pursues what is believed to be lacking for someone or some group based on what is believed to be possessed by other people, all right? So these people get this. These people don't get this. So let's make sure they get this. Or these people have this. So let's take from those that have that and let's give it to those. It's a it's a redistribution. And this is clearly defined in social justice. You should research it. You'll find it is a redistribution of power and prosperity, what it boils down to. Justice, though, is driven by what is morally acceptable or what God says is right. Social justice is driven by what people say is right, what the culture says is right, what society says is right. So there's this clear clarification. Uh, and Paul talked about it, you know, the, the mind of God and the, the mind of the world, the, the flesh and the spirit. In other words, it's uh, what does the world say? What does God say? Jesus said very clearly, there's two roads. Stick to the one and find out what God says and live by those standards. Jesus didn't pursue social justice as it's presented in the culture, in his culture or our culture. Jesus came with a very distinct mission in his heart and mind to seek and save that which is lost. The answer is not going to be far found in reformation of culture and society. The answer is going to be found in the transformation of people by the power of God's spirit and by the power of the word of God as they pursue Jesus. Jesus said, I must be about my father's business. It's the same thing for Christians. We should be about the father's business. Paul wrote to Timothy, a good soldier does not entangle himself with the affairs of this world. So if we're involved in our world, we're involved from a different platform and from a different perspective, and it is the Word of God and the standards of morality and the standards of truth that God gives us. Instance of social justice. They said there were three basic groups that social justice is identified and dealing with. Again, this is not the Joe Arm definition. Follow what the, what the culture says and what they define themselves, whether you go to Wikipedia, uh, dictionary.com, whatever it is. Take, for instance, the LGD, <laughs> LGBTQ plus, plus meaning anybody that will join on board with them. You know, they say that they demand that the society uh, grant them the same, uh, well, the legitimization of marriage. All right. When God says that marriage is between a man and a woman, it's clearly defined throughout scriptures, Old Testament, New Testament. Marriage, what it is. Even when he talks about divorce, he explains it's between a man and a woman. All right. But social justice demands it. In fact, will not tolerate any other idea but what they say. And it that's where they're heading. It's one of the favorite groups of social justice. It doesn't favor, though. God's word does not favor any group over another group. All right. Social justice will elevate the needs of one group over the needs of another group. I think if you really want to get a clear, I want to think better uh, discussions I heard on YouTube recently was Vodi Bauckham. That's Vodi with a V, Bauckham, B-A-U-C-H-A-M. And you can go to YouTube and just look at that and, and put that in Vodi Bauckham on social justice. and It'll bring up a, a message by Vodi that was he preached a couple of years ago. And it was just, it, he clearly defines what social justice is from a biblical perspective and what biblical justice is. So God's word says we stand in one platform. Social justice says we stand in the world's platform. And it favors groups over individuals, groups over other groups. So when I vote, I want to stand for justice. I believe in freedom of religion in America. Religion's been marginalized. We've taken God, it's Ten Commandments, out of the courtrooms, out of the schoolrooms and classrooms all across America. 
you know, we've tried to silence the voice of the church when it comes to voting and politics. The LBJ, Linda Baines Johnson, passed what was called the Johnson Amendment. He was concerned that he might not be elected because the Christians within within America were making a voice that was being loudly heard about standing for what is right and what is wrong. He didn't want that influencing the election. So he passed a law, and it was accepted by the uh, into law, to just basically was to silence churches that they can't, they can't endorse people a person or a platform as a church, all right? It's a violation of the law now. That didn't happen until LBJ. The church was the most influential voice in America up till that particular point. And, you know, separation of church and state is what they continue to do. That's another sermon. But social justice would call what I say even here was I talk about, you know, uh, different groups and what the Bible says about morality, what the Bible says about homosexuality, uh, me to say those things and to raise the standard of what God, this is the word of God, that's hate speech according to social justice. But I believe in freedom of speech. When I enter the voting booth, I want to vote for people who are going to support my freedom to speech. It's one of the most important freedoms I have as a preacher to preach the word of God and to unashamedly stand for Jesus Christ and believe with all my heart that a system is not going to change America and a, a social system is not going to change America. Jesus is the change that America needs. Christ being enthroned in people's hearts and lives is what transform people. There are parties and groups of people who, who, who stand on a principle they call a, uh, systemic racism. I don't believe in systemic racism. It basically means that if you're a white American, then you, you're guilty of racism. That whether you believe it or not, whether you know it or not, whether you're intentional or not, that if you're very, very hard of hearts, you're just a racist. I don't believe that. I don't believe that Americans are. I don't believe that our Constitution or I don't believe our educational system has been defiled by that mindset. It's been defiled by some people who've mistreated other people by some bad laws that need to be undone, just by some by some methodology of certain people who have minimized in, uh, certain groups of people. and But to be systemic racist means it's at the core. It's like a, America's rotten at the very core. I don't believe that. I believe it's based on biblical foundations. It takes us time to grow into understanding what those basically mean in our country, but I don't believe it. I believe that Americans... Uh, are, are good people. Who is it that reaches out to the world no matter what their nationality, race, or creed is? It's Americans. When national to international disasters or national disasters come, it's America that reaches out from the good of their hearts and donates billions, shiploads, truckloads of money and food to help in times of crisis. This particular movement of social justice will also seek to, to, uh, be negative and, and towards the church, but towards evangelicals when they talk about their lack of love and their lack of community and their lack of caring. But yet it is the church through missions, through mission endeavors that has literally transformed nations. It is the church that has built the hospitals over the centuries. It is the church that has had the pro-life movement to help with clinics, to help with but people who had the unplanned pregnancy, so to say. It is the church that has stood with the adoption agencies. It is the church. It is Christians by the score and by the hundreds of thousands who stood in line to help people, to give to people, and to care about people. It's the church that has developed systems for people when they come out of prison to find a, a changed life, to have a, an answer for what lies next in their life. It's the church which has stood against the injustices that have taken place in our culture. No, not all people and not all churches, but there are hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, who love God and want to stand to help people, minister to people, and change people up. Majority of Christians are good folks. Majority of Americans are good people, no matter what their skin color is. They love other people. They love people. They love God. But don't fall into this demonization of the evangelicals or of the church today. There are bad people. There's bad pastors. There's some bad churches. The Bible says there'll be in, in the end times, there'll be a lot of churches that are apostate churches who will embrace the world, the principles of the world, the philosophies of the world. They'll move the social route instead of the gospel route, instead of the cross route. The gospel of Jesus Christ changes hearts when it's believed. It changes that racist person into a lover of people. It changes that person who has no value system in life to a person who has a, is a decent, upright, moral, upstanding person who cares about people and loves people. It takes the most self-absorbed narcissist in the culture, and when they choose Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, they become the person, the most caring person that you could possibly imagine. It takes, it takes the immoral person and changes their life into a life of decency in life of caring for other people. No person, no office, no individual is perfect, all right? I'm not perfect, you're not perfect, so quit passing such quick judgment on everybody else. The Bible says we're going to be judged with the same standard that we measure out, so we better use the gospel and the word of God as our standard of judgment. 
Listen, let me just close with this. And I've taken a little bit longer than I normally do, but I think it's important to clarify some of these things. I'll be in about 16 minutes by the time we're done here. Uh, Kathy, you had to, my wife had to have open heart surgery a couple of years ago. Many of you know about that. Uh, I asked my cardiologist who would recommend. I said, I want the very best that you can recommend to us you think would let us in. He began to tell me about the leading heart surgeon in the medical center in Houston. He told me this is the guy who, who works on the, the king of, of Bulgaria. He's worked on the, the presidents of the United States. He was uh, uh, George W. Uh, George H. Bush's uh, uh, heart surgeon. He was Barbara Bush's heart surgeon. He said he's the best, and he's not going to look at it and go in and say, let's do, take the easier out and put in some plastic valve versus a repairing a valve. He said most heart surgeons don't have the skill set to to do an actual repair on a physical valve. They'll just replace the valve. He said this guy, if you can get in, he can do it right. You don't have to be redoing again in five to ten years. It'll last a lifetime. So that's the guy we wanted. And when we sat down, and by the way, uh, supernaturally God allowed us to have that particular heart surgeon. When we sat down with him, I didn't ask him about his Twitter handle. I didn't ask him about what he tweeted. I didn't ask him about how many times he'd been married. We didn't get into those discussions. I didn't ask him if he was a, a sweet person. You know, I just wanted to know if he could take care of my wife, you know, minister to her deepest need and do it right and do it where, we, where, 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 where I had some confidence in, in his skill set. And he clearly explained to me what the processes would be and what his skill set was and what he would seek to do over and above what others might and procedures they might carry out. I didn't ask him if he knew the 66 books of the Bible, all right? I didn't ask him about his personality. I just wanted the one who could do what needed to be done. When I vote, no matter what position of political party or what I'm looking at, I vote. I want to see the person who can get it done closest to what God would say is just and right and equitable. I pray that you'll let the Holy Spirit guide you in your voting decisions, that you won't look at anything else but first and foremost, realizing that people are imperfect, Parties and platforms are imperfect, but what is going to be the closest to the biblical convictions of what the God describes are the standards that we live by as Christians. God help you. God bless you. I love you. And I hope this really ministers to you on some level. Remember that Jesus is still Lord in this world and he's coming soon. God bless you.